Five Nights at Freddy's has a pretty big story, but when you look at the games on a surface level, it can be difficult to tell what's happening when. This is particularly true when you factor in that the books, games, and the new Five Nights at Freddy's movie may have overlapping elements, but they are still their own separate continuities of events. So, with the movie opening the franchise up to those only loosely acquainted with the series, I figured now would be a good time to explain just what's going on in these games for any fans, new or old, who may have questions about the lore. So, strap in and stay tuned till the end for a special announcement, because I'm going to go over the full time timeline of the Five Nights at Freddy's games. Before I get into the story itself, please note that this is my own understanding of the timeline, and due to the nature of the franchise, you and others may disagree with my interpretations. If you have any concerns about the events or placements I put forward, detailed explanations for why and how events are placed can be found in my previous videos, which will be linked in the description and noted on screen when applicable. In any case, if you watched through to the end, I hope that you'll find this timeline at least somewhat helpful in your understanding of the franchise. Our story begins with two inventors, Willie Mafton and Henry Emily, who were living with their families in or around Hurricane, Utah, yes, Hurricane is pronounced that way, in the late 70s slash early 80s. Together, they co-founded a restaurant called Fred Bear's Family Diner, where they used their skills in robotics to create animatronic characters that could double as wearable mascot costumes. Now, these weren't regular animatronics, but rather special animatronics they had invented called springlock suits. By winding the springlocks, the animatronic parts would be pulled back to the sides of the suit to make room for a human performer. However, the springlocks weren't exactly stable, so if you touched, breathed on, or got the springlocks wet, they could break loose, driving the animatronic parts into the body of whoever was wearing the suit at the time. How this restaurant didn't get shut down for OSHA violations, I don't know. But in spite of the major safety risk, the place stayed open and got pretty dang popular. It got so popular, in fact, that by 1983, it got a TV show, and William and Henry started a restaurant chain called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza under the brand Fazbear Entertainment. Freddy's not only used Spring Bonnie and Fredbear springlock suits like Fredbear's Family Diner, but it added new characters in Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. Now, Henry was generally a pretty reasonable guy if you ignore him thinking the springlock suits were a good idea. He was also the one who was more handy in the robotics department between the two of them. He was the one primarily responsible for making the animatronics, and even made a special animatronic, the puppet, to make sure his daughter Charlie didn't wander off while he couldn't watch her at work. William, on the other hand, may not have been as skilled with robots, but he did have pretty high charisma. While Henry was the main force behind the animatronics, William was the businessman of the duo. However, he was not exactly a mentally stable person, which is probably why his wife left him, but we don't know much about her other than we don't really see her and she probably died. Anyway, William had what one might call issues, and would flip-flop between near worship and extreme jealousy of his business partner. So on one rainy night, the first domino fell when the puppet was trapped in its box and Charlie Emily was locked outside of Freddy's. William happened to be driving by and was firmly on the extreme jealousy side of things at that moment because upon seeing Henry's daughter stuck outside the restaurant, he got out of the car and instead of letting her back inside, he killed her and drove away, leaving her body lying in the alleyway. The puppet, meanwhile, managed to break free and to make good on its programming to keep Charlie inside, it followed her into the alleyway, where due to damage from the rain, it collapsed on her body. Now, in FNAF, particularly strong emotions, with the most powerful being agony, tend to linger in the environment and often get absorbed into nearby objects. Metal in particular acts as a good conductor for non-physical aspects of the world, such as emotion, memories, or spirits. And when one of these things is absorbed by the metal, the end result is something called remnant. While other objects can get possessed, remnant is special in that it can not only be used to anchor spirits to a vessel and function as a source of energy, but when extracted, it could be used to heal someone from beyond the point of death, providing functional immortality. Mortality. So, when the puppet collapsed on Charlie's body, a couple things happened. First, the metal in the puppet reacted with the emotions and lingering spirit from Charlie's death and created Remnant, tying her spirit to the animatronic and causing dark tear streaks to appear on the puppet's face where there weren't any before. Second, the agony from the event created a shadow entity that borrowed its rabbit-like appearance from Charlie's killer, who would perform in the Spring Bonnie Rabbit animatronic, and had such a strong connection with the thing that in the books, Bone Rabbit Ears manifested on his ghost. The shadow's official name is RWQFSFASXE but it's usually just called Shadow Bonnie for convenience. Anyway, Charlie's disappearance was noted, and a search was started for her inside the restaurant. However, the person who found her wasn't one of the already present patrons. While I've talked about Henry having a kid, I haven't mentioned that William had three kids of his own. Michael, Elizabeth, and another son who we don't have an actual name for, but is often called the Crying Child, or Cece, for reasons that will be relevant soon. Cece really liked the animatronic characters, and would often sneak away from home to see them perform. In this instance, however, he was in his room when Shadow Bonnie showed up outside his house, got his attention by breaking the window, and led him to the alleys outside the restaurant, where Cece got the lovely experience of seeing his dad's business partner's daughter, who he was probably friends with, bleeding out. Understandably, the child was traumatized, and thought that the animatronic lying on her body was what had killed her. Meanwhile, William eventually got back home from whatever errand he was on before he got the craving to commit stab, and while Michael told him to go easy on Cece since he'd had a bad 
bad day, William promptly ignored his son's advice and went to his youngest son's room. The door was locked, which William was not happy about, so he went around the back of the house to find a way in, only to see the broken window, a pair of weird oversized rabbit tracks, and a trail of footsteps leading towards the restaurant. Realizing where his son had gone, William was not happy, and decided to make sure the kid would be sorry when he got back. Cece was probably already pretty sorry he'd left the house, given what he'd just seen, but in any case, Charlie's body and the animatronic on top of it were reported. As for how William decided to punish him when he got home, that needs a bit of context. See, when the puppet came back looking not the same as it had last William saw it, William was suspicious and decided to do some investigating. This eventually led to him figuring out what Remnant was, and he was fascinated. So, noting how Remnant could be created from strong emotion, he made the perfectly rational decision to build an underground bunker and run experiments on his son using nightmare hallucination gas to see if fear would be strong enough to create what he was looking for. For the experiments, William decided to take his son's newly established fear of animatronics and reinforce that, creating home-styled environments with nightmarish animatronics that Cece, under the influence of the hallucination gas, would see as alive and trying to kill him. On top of this, since Cece was only scared of the animatronics, not the characters themselves, William used a plushie of Fredbear with a walkie-talkie inside of it to reinforce that the animatronics were something to fear, even when Cece was out and about. Understandably, this was not great for Cece's mental state, which left the poor kid constantly crying, hence the name crying child. Michael, being a teenager, saw his now crybaby brother as an excellent prank victim and would try to provoke reactions because he thought it was funny. This escalated until on the day of Cece's birthday, Michael and his friends had the brilliant idea of sticking his head into the mouth of the Fredbear animatronic while it was performing. Despite the associated meme you may or may not be aware of, the resulting incident was not the bite of 87, but the bite of 83. Cece was put in a coma and hospitalized from the incident, which Mike felt super guilty about. But what's interesting is that some of Cece's agony, or a part of his spirit, was left in Fredbear when the bite happened. And Charlie, now having special abilities after possessing the puppet, was able to use that connection to put him back together inside Fredbear. Putting someone back together in this franchise typically refers to restoring a spirit's sense of identity and allowing a full merger of the spirit and vessel. This, and the agony entity that emerged from Cece's death and nightmares, Shadow Freddy, will be relevant later. William, with his nightmare experiments not really having the intended effect, figured that the best way to try and get more remnant would be to experiment with similar circumstances to the one that led to his discovery in the first place. William made designs for a bunch of animatronics specifically made to lure, capture, and kill children. After all, if it wasn't him doing the killing, he'd have an alibi, as he would be somewhere else, and it could be blamed on machine failure. How did he get this past the board of Fazbear Entertainment even after we hear them questioning the weird designs in the games? No idea! But somehow the designs were cleared, and William set up Circus Baby's Pizza World, starring the Funtime animatronics Ballora, Funtime Foxy, Funtime Freddy and Bonbon, bon, and Circus Baby. Now, Circus Baby was the important one here. She was built to count how many people were present to make sure that when she snatched a child, there wouldn't be any witnesses, and William made her based on his daughter Elizabeth father of the year award for dedicating his child murder bot to his daughter, particularly given Elizabeth, who was pretty desperate for any sign of her father's affection, didn't listen to her dad when he told her to not go near the animatronic, and she ended up alone with Circus Baby on opening day. The consequence was about what you'd expect, and Elizabeth was killed. Circus Babies was promptly shut down under the excuse of gas leaks, and the fun times were shoved into William's nightmare bunker, where William was continuing his remnant experimentation with what he had. And oh, would you look at that! Circus Baby's eyes are green instead of blue now. I'm sure this has absolutely nothing to do with Elizabeth having had green eyes and having died inside the animatronic. Sometime after Circus Baby's closure, the instability of the spring lock suits finally caused a big enough problem at a sister location of Freddy's, probably Fredbear's since the location shut down at some point, and the spring lock suits were retired from use and put into storage. Meanwhile, William was now down two kids, and the failure of the fun times did not leave him particularly keen on using them for the time being. Instead, he decided to take matters more directly into his own hands. So, on June 26, 1985, William took the spring bonnie suit out of storage and lured five children into the back room of Freddy Fazbear pizza, where he murdered them and stuffed their bodies into the four main animatronics and the Fredbear animatronic that the crying child was in. This simultaneously gave the physical proximity needed for Remnant to form, and worked as a way to hide the bodies. When the disappearances were reported and Freddy's was searched, no one thought to check inside the animatronics. The police arrested William, but due to the lack of evidence, they had to let him go. This event is commonly referred to as the Missing Children Incident, or MCI. On the spiritual side of things, the puppet was present in the location. So when the kids were killed, Charlie was able to use her abilities to help give them life inside the animatronic they were put into, possibly using Cece's memories and remnant to help stabilize them. After the MCI, Freddy struggled to remain operational for a bit, but eventually shut down. To make the most of things, Fazbear Entertainment reopened Circus Babies as an entertainment and rental service operating out of William's experiment bunker. While William had been able to get some of the remnant he'd collected into the bunker, he wasn't exactly trusted, having been arrested for child murder. So, since he still had stuff he wanted done in there, he grabbed his one remaining child, got him a job as a nighttime technician at Circus Babies, and sent him off with the instructions of putting his sister back together 
before promptly dipping and taking on a fake identity so he could continue doing his thing without scrutiny. Meanwhile, Michael Afton went down to the bunker and had a rather unpleasant time. He found his sister possessing Circus Baby, almost died a bunch of times because the Fun Times recognized him and thought he was his dad, and in his attempts to help Elizabeth, he got lured into the scooping room, where an amalgamation of all the Fun Times, called Ennard, used the scooper that took the casings off of animatronics to remove his internal organs so they could use him as a skin suit to escape the bunker. But hey, he apparently successfully put his sister back together, so mission accomplished, I guess? Ennard sort of wandered around for a while as Mike's body decayed, much to the concern of the neighbors, but eventually the body got too damaged to keep using, so Ennard was projectile vomited into the sewers. But since no one in the Afton family stays dead for more than two minutes at a time, after getting a very repetitive pep talk of you won't die from his sister, Michael pulled himself off the pavement. Turns out that the scooper wasn't just for removing the casings of animatronics. William had been experimenting with the effects of remnant on animatronics that didn't already have a soul, and made the scooper as a remnant injector. So when Mike got scooped, the remnant that had been in the scooper was injected into his body, keeping him from dying. Michael, having had his life effectively ruined doing his dad's dirty work, vowed to track down his father. Meanwhile, William, now under a false identity, needed a way to get more remnant. So when Fazbear Entertainment tried to reboot the Freddy's franchise, he saw it as the perfect opportunity, and took up a job as a night security guard. Thing is, the animatronics weren't exactly fans of his. Withered versions of the original animatronics possessed by the kids he killed were there, the new toy animatronics had access to criminal databases to help them stop predators, and to top it all off, Fazbear had taken the Charlie Possessed puppet out of storage for this location. Needless to say, William did not have a great week. Eventually, he complained enough about the animatronics trying to break into the office that he was switched to the day shift. Enter the new night guard, Jeremy Fitzgerald. He may not have been William, but the animatronics had pretty major stranger danger issues regarding adults and employees at this point, so Jeremy was not let off the hook. This was not helped by William taking the spring bonnie suit and adding to his kill count during the day shift. Due to the new round of murders, investigations started back up. William was fired, and Freddy's tried to get in contact with Henry. You may have noticed that Henry hasn't made much of an appearance since Charlie died, and wondered about what he's been up to. Expect to continue wondering for the foreseeable future. Anyway, Jeremy was moved to the day shift for the last event Freddy's had before closing down again. Unfortunately for him, he was probably the victim of the infamous Bite of 87. Meanwhile, the night shift needed to be filled, and Michael Afton had heard about his father getting up to things at the location, so he applied for and got the job under the name Fritz Smith. With the animatronics being possessed and on the attack, he did something to fend them off or attempt to release the spirits, and was promptly fired after one night for tampering with the animatronics and odor. Fazbear Entertainment wasn't done, however, even if they now had a drastically reduced budget and had to scrap the toy animatronics. They took the original animatronics back to the original restaurant and set to work fixing them and the building up to reopen. But Fazbear is terrible at screening their employees, so William got another night security job. This time, he hid out in the safe room, which wasn't on any cameras and inaccessible to the animatronics. At some point, William had developed a connection with Shadow Freddy, potentially since it was somewhat created from the fear he had induced in Cece, and was able to use it to lure the animatronics to just outside the safe room so that he could dismantle them. This had the consequence of the spirits manifesting outside of their broken vessels and chasing William into the safe room. After panicking for a bit, William put on the spring bonnie suit to either intimidate the spirits or disguise himself. The thing is, it was raining, and the building still hadn't been fixed all the way so there was a leak in the ceiling, and he was wearing a spring lock suit. It went about as well for him as you'd expect, and the spirits returned to their vessels. Later, the daytime employees got there, only to find the animatronics broken on the ground and a dead body in the safe room. So they hired a construction crew to seal off the safe room, blamed it on budget restrictions, and told the rest of the employees they weren't allowed to get their stuff out beforehand and to not tell anyone the safe rooms were ever a thing so that no one would find the dead body. Eventually, they fixed the restaurant and animatronics and finally reopened. One employee, known as Phone Guy, had been working for Fazbear since before the spring locks were retired, and after the incident in 87, decided to take the night shift when the place reopened, so when Freddy's opened, he did just that. Honestly, he managed pretty well, all things considered, but eventually it got to be too much for him. So in November of 1993, he started his last week on the job and recorded some advice calls on the phone for whoever would take over after him. He never got to finish though, cause on the fourth night of that week, he got killed by the spiritual manifestation of the animatronic that was once Fredbear, Golden Freddy. So who else would they hire for his replacement, but one Mike Schmidt, AKA Michael Afton, under a different fake name since the last one got fired. This time, he lasted longer than a day. And remember how I mentioned the crying child spirit being in Fredbear now Golden Freddy? Well, Mike started getting haunted by his brother, which was a rather unpleasant experience as it manifested as experiencing the nightmare experiment trauma in his dreams, albeit with bits of his own personal experience mixed in. Mike lasted a week at Freddy's before once again getting fired for tampering with the animatronics, potentially to try and help his brother, unprofessionalism, and odor, and Freddy shut down again soon after. After that, there's a fun 30 year time skip we don't know much about, but in 2023, this guy called Phone Dude went, hey, wouldn't it be cool to make a horror attraction based on the murders at that Freddy's place from back in the 80s? And Fazbear's Fright was born. The place was somewhat flammable, with Phone Dude doing his best to make the location look as authentic as possible to a restaurant left to rot for decades, but it was there and it was functional. It even had a security guard, who was none other than Michael 
laughed in. Anyway, Phone Dude had been raiding Freddy's locations for cool stuff for the attraction, but time, the elements, and other people hadn't left much in the way of full and functional animatronics. So when he heard that there were these safe room things that were sealed off, he went to check that out to see if he could find anything. Cue a day later, Mike is on shift, Phone Dude tells him that they now had a real animatronic and it was in the building. And then it turned out that said animatronic was the exact guy Mike had spent the past several decades trying to find. Remember how agony is one of the strongest emotions that can create remnant? Well, unfortunately for everyone, spring locking is a very painful way to die, and as such, William did not stay dead. Instead, he ended up haunting the spring bonnie suit and his corpse, making him into the animatronic called Springtrap. Mike eventually got sick of the father-son reunion, and at the end of his week, burned the place to the ground. Unfortunately, this did not get rid of William, whose whole brand is always coming back, and Springtrap, though damaged, was able to escape. But it turns out the two Aftons weren't the only ones who had been there. Haunted parts of the original animatronics, as well as an intact puppet that snuck in, had been in the location, and the puppet had the ability to set up something called Happiest Day for the spirits, that would give them all the ability to move on. Happiest Day focused on Cece, possibly because Charlie may have used his memories in Remnant to help give life to the other kids, so he needed to be able to rest for the others to move on. The thing is, if this happiest day did happen, it certainly doesn't seem like any of the spirits moved on, because Henry caught wind of the whole haunted animatronics thing after the fire and had a whole crisis about how the animatronics he made held the souls of the kids killed by his former business partner, and how they wouldn't be able to rest with the way things were. So, when the remains of the stuff in Fazbear's Fright was auctioned off, Henry bought the haunted stuff, got a hold of William's research on Remnant, and started his master plan to put things to an end, making another Freddy's restaurant. The plan was he'd lure in any animatronics that had Remnant by impersonating William and promising remnant or something along those lines. Then stick them in a vent maze under the main floor of the pizzeria, and finally, set them all on fire. Now, Henry couldn't be the one to actually run the place since the jig would be up if he did, so he put out a job offer for a franchisee to do the job. He expected that some random person who didn't know anything and as such wouldn't be suspicious would take the job and follow his instructions about bringing in the weird animatronics that showed up in the back alley. And the person he got was Michael Afton. There are four animatronics that Mike brought in and stuck in Henry's vent maze over the course of the week. Molten Freddy was all the fun times minus Circus Baby, who had been kicked out of Ennard for being too bossy. Scrap Baby was the result of Elizabeth fixing herself after getting ejected. Scrap Trap, aka William, who had sustained a bunch of damage since the fire but had repaired and healed himself to some degree with similar parts and remnant he managed to get in the time between, was well aware that this was a setup, but was intrigued enough to come anyway. And finally, Lefty was an animatronic Henry built to capture the puppet and keep it under control with the steady flow of electricity. And if you were Wondering? Yes, he did this knowing his daughter was in there. The final night arrived, and Scrap Baby was excited about the opportunity to make her dad proud of her, only for Henry to interrupt and reveal that, yeah, this was a trap to force everyone to move on, and that while he'd planned an escape route for whoever he'd hired, he figured Mike was probably sick and tired of everything at this point as well, so they would all burn together. Issue is, Henry was relying on William's research notes that theorized that high temperatures would destroy the effects of Remnant, and assumed that it would be enough to make a spirit move on when they didn't want to, and that is not how it works. If a spirit isn't willing, you can't just set them on fire to make them go away, and there was one spirit in particular who wasn't ready to move on at all. Cassidy, the spirit who shared Golden Freddy with Cece, was pretty upset about the whole being murdered thing and wanted William to suffer. So despite warnings from a spiritual entity we don't know a ton about called Old Man Consequences, to let herself rest and leave the demon to his demons, this vengeful spirit anchored herself to William's soul and forced him to experience a nightmare coma where he was attacked by manifestations of a whole bunch of animatronics. And she wasn't the only spirit that didn't move on either. Charlie stuck around to help as well, and Cece seems to have done likewise. On top of this, Elizabeth hadn't had any closure with her desperation for some sign of her dad caring about her, and Mike had not successfully accomplished his goal of getting rid of his dad. So pretty much none of the spirits actually ended up moving on. Heck, Fazbear Entertainment had shut down after the fire, but it started back up relatively soon after and got massively successful again. However, with its success, talk of the murders came up, so the company hired an indie game developer to make horror games based on the tragedies to mock and discredit them. Of course, Fazbear couldn't have it known that they were the ones to hire him to make the games, so they pretended to not be involved, and after several years of the indie devs games being public conversation, Fazbear hired a company to make an official VR game to take the actual events that happened and play them off as fictional scenarios. To help with the process, Fazbear gave them the AI program they used for story generation for their other games called Mimic 1, and some funky old circuit boards and such that were supposedly to help with pathfinding. Two things here. First, it didn't really fit to explain earlier, but way back in the early days of Fazbear Entertainment, there was this guy who built an animatronic called the Mimic, which is what the Mimic 1 program was originally made for. The Mimic would copy behaviors it saw and replicate them. Unfortunately, the Mimic had been infused with its creator's rage which gave the Mimic a tendency to take what it copied in the direction of extreme violence. But even after it was deactivated for causing problems, Fazbear decided to keep it around. This will be relevant later. As for the circuit boards, it turns out that the reason they worked for pathfinding was because they were from animatronics that had been found in the burn 
burned down Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place and had those pathing systems built in. Why give them old circuit boards from burnt animatronics? Well, given the circuit boards were stolen back from the game developers and later given to another company to infect the animatronics they were making with the same code, it seems like whoever gave them those circuit boards in the first place knew exactly what they were doing. As for the VR game, it turns out that Spring Bonnie was built with special show protocols that allowed the wearer to control any animatronics linked to its code. So when his circuit boards were scanned, William Afton was given an escape from Cassidy's nightmare coma and connected to the game. With this connection, William hijacked the Mimic 1 program and created the digital entity Glitchtrap. The nature of VR and Glitchtrap's status as a living computer virus allowed William to use Glitchtrap to hijack and influence the minds of the beta testers. The first one sliced off his face. The second found out that Glitchtrap had hidden himself in the audio log she was recording to document things, so she tried to split them up to get rid of them, but was Glitchtrapped in the process. Meanwhile, Fazbear Entertainment has started to build a new attraction starring new Glamrock animatronics called Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex. And taking the term cover-up very literally, they built it directly on top of Henry's Pizzeria. But not before having the Mimic brought in there for unspecified reasons, which ended up with a lot of deaths when it was programmed to make a pile of endoskeleton limbs and chose to include humans in that category. Eventually, it was sealed in like the basement's basement's basement behind a wall of concrete and a fancy computer program called Mixus was implemented to keep it there. While the Pizzaplex was being built, development of the game moved back to Fazbear Entertainment and a new beta tester, Vanessa, took over. And despite her best efforts, was hijacked by Glitchtrap. She attempted to go about her normal job, but Glitchtrap's influence led to her searching suspicious stuff on company computers, like how far you can cut someone in half before they lose consciousness, which triggered red flags in the system. Eventually, she got so suspicious that she was forced to start going to company-mandated therapy. This was bad news for William, who had plans for her and didn't want the scrutiny from people who weren't in on things. So, a robotic duplicate of Vanessa was made to take over normal daily tasks, leaving the original to operate without suspicion. Now, the new Vanessa bot would have struggled to act completely human on her own, so the spirit of Elizabeth Afton, who was terrified of disobeying her father after how that went for her last time, was put into the robot, and Vanessa's records were changed to more closely match Elizabeth's life for therapy session purposes. Elizabeth, under Vanessa's name, purchased costume materials and handed them off to the original Vanessa, who made a white rabbit costume and took on the identity of Vanny. While Vanny could be considered to come from her real name and the word bunny, it also relates to a mask that looks a lot like her costume that was connected to something called the Vanny Network. This was an augmented reality, or AR overlay of the Pizzaplex that could be used to manipulate various technological aspects of the Pizzaplex and make things appear that weren't real. It worked by permanently implanting an occipital lobe transponder in the wearer's head that could interface with the part of the brain that controls visual perception. And it's good to note that while the full AR world was restricted to the mask being on, the chip's ability to make someone experience things that weren't actually real was not. And also it was connected to Glitchtrap. This will cause problems later. On a related note, a local boy, Gregory, was kidnapped, probably killed, and replaced with a robot that had Glitchtrap and something similar to the AR chip built in. He was sent to the same therapist as Elizabeth, who I will be calling Vanessa from here on out, to keep her in line and kill the therapist if they got too close to the truth. After Vanny and Vanessa were transferred to the Pizzaplex as a security guard, Gregory used his hacking skills to implement Glitchtrap into the place's systems and animatronics. He also made friends with a girl named Cassie, the daughter of one of the Pizzaplex technicians, after noticing that no one showed up for her birthday party. This is another thing that will be relevant later. As for the other spirits, William got Cassidy off his back by trapping her to some degree in the Princess Quest Arcade trilogy that also functioned as Glitchtrap's access point to the Pizzaplex. But he didn't want to be stuck as just a virus operating out of his very broken body, so he had Vanny head down into the old pizzeria to help repair him. Because the way into the area he was in had since been blocked to keep him from being found, the Pizzaplex's Glamrock Freddy animatronic was used to clear the way, and in the process came into contact with the spirit of Michael Afton. The thing is, spirits tend to have memory problems, and after Mike's body was burned, he sort of forgot everything. But hey, Freddy got an upgraded sense of agency, so that's something. Meanwhile, Gregory came into contact with the crying child spirit, got possessed, and was able to break free from Glitchtrap's control. To avoid getting recaptured, he hid out in the Pizzaplex where he tried to put his memories back in order using post-it notes and deactivated staff robots. As for Charlie's spirit, her name is in the files for the post-it note room Gregory was hiding out in, and there's evidence of another kid living at the Pizzaplex, so even if we don't know exactly who and where she is yet, chances are she's possessing another robot kid and moved into the room with Gregory. Eventually, the two of them tried to escape the Pizzaplex, and while Charlie was successful, Gregory was caught by Vanessa. Now, while Gregory might not have been controlled by Glitchtrap anymore, the virus and occipital transponder were still in his head, and being a robot made him particularly susceptible to tampering. So William took back up the hobby of subjecting his youngest son to perception-altering experiments. Gregory had a decent chunk of his memories blocked, was allowed to escape Vanessa, and the Glamrock animatronics were sent to hunt him down. Whenever Gregory got to a point where he would escape, he would experience a false escape and wake right back up where he started, with things having been reset to the way things were. There were some hiccups, however. Freddy being possessed by Mike 
Michael had made it so when Gregory had initially tried to escape and the command to capture him on site was set, Freddy glitched out on stage after seeing Gregory in the crowd and was set to safe mode, which blocked out glitch trap. As such, Gregory was able to hide in Freddy's stomach hatch to avoid danger. Gregory made a bunch of escape attempts and after each, he managed to retain the memory of the result somewhat and would draw a comic page of it as a reminder. Finally, he managed to escape the simulation by going straight to the source. He and Freddy made it under the pizza plex to the Freddy's it had been built on and as they went further in, Freddy started to remember having previously been Michael, which was all well and good, but not enough to stop William from hijacking his body directly. Fortunately, even if fire doesn't get rid of spirits, it still hurts. So using the stuff Henry had set the place on fire with, Gregory joined the set William Afton on Fire Club, and he and Freddy booked it further into the place. Meanwhile, remember the pile of humans and animatronics the Mimic made earlier? Yeah, well that thing was very agony-infused, and with the gift of life, it decided to snatch William and incorporate him into it. The tangle of animatronics then burrowed their way out of the pizzeria, effectively causing a massive earthquake. All this cut off William's influence from the Pizzaplex, leaving the Mimic program as the only part of Glitch Trap left in the building. This seemingly did not apply to Vanny, given she vandalized the abandoned Pizzaplex after all of this. Gregory and Freddy, meanwhile, may have left the building for a bit, but if they did, they eventually went back down to the basement, found and escaped the Mimic, but ended up stuck down there. However, if Mimic had seen Gregory, and thanks to its code being part of Glitchtrap, was able to put its mimicking to work to impersonate him and reach out to Cassie from within the Pizzaplex. Cassie had been worried about Gregory since, after he had broken free and hid out in the Pizzaplex, he was reported missing. So when she got a message supposedly from him saying he was in the Pizzaplex, which had been closed for repairs thanks to the earthquake, she went to go find him. The real Gregory caught wind of this and frantically tried to contact Cassie to warn her, but was largely unsuccessful. Once inside, Cassie got a Vanny mask that implanted a transponder in her head. The Mimic, with its connections to the Vanny mask, was able to manipulate Cassie into deactivating the security notes, keeping it trapped. The Mixes program that had been keeping Mimic there was not happy about this, but was unsuccessful in stopping Cassie from deactivating it and the rest of security as Mimic guided her through the building via walkie-talkie. Unfortunately for Cassie, deactivating security and knocking down the intentionally placed concrete wall did not reveal Gregory, but rather the Mimic, who only didn't kill her because Roxy, one of the Glamrock animatronics, liked Cassie Cassie and fought it off long enough for the real Gregory to finally reach Cassie and guide her to an elevator that would allow her to escape and for Gregory to explain what's going on. However, while Cassie did make it to the elevator, the Mimic was able to hijack it and the intercom, cutting Gregory off mid-explanation and impersonating him once again as it sent the elevator plummeting even further beneath the pizzeria where the Mimic, now using Roxy's voice, called out to her. And that, my friends, covers just about the entire main story of Five Nights at Freddy's. Not that there isn't more to talk about, of course, from haunted wet floor signs to a new scooper in the burned out pizzeria, there is a a lot going on that we still don't know or only have loose story connections for and as such are difficult to incorporate into the overarching narrative. But until future games give us some answers, this video should serve as a solid base for understanding just what's going on in Five Nights at Freddy's. And hey, if you don't like my interpretations even after watching my explanation videos, there are plenty of other FNAF YouTubers who either recently or will soon be releasing their own timelines that you might like better. Half of the fun in FNAF is finding what story makes the most sense to you, so don't be shy to combine theories or come up with your own interpretations. Now remember the special announcement I mentioned earlier? Well, turns out you may be able to have your very own ID plushie. As of today, an official makeshift petition is accessible through the link in the description and pinned comment. And if enough people show interest over the course of the week that it's live, I'll be able to work with makeshift to turn me into a marketable plushie that you guys can buy. So if this is at all of interest to you, whether that be to scream into while theorizing or punt at the nearest wall when the lore gets crazy, please head to the petition page and show your support with the $2 pledge that will either translate to full price into plushie if the petition works out, or be refunded in full if it doesn't. But with all that said, I hope this timeline was helpful for you. And if it was, please consider subscribing and sharing it with a friend. But whatever the case may be, don't get stabbed and have a nice day.